Welcome to our lesson preview for this coming week. And we are going to uh, study about the hope of uh, a new life in the New Testament. If you remember, uh, a couple weeks ago, we studied about the hope in the Old Testament. We also um, learned about the hope within the Gospels and, and through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But this week, we're going to talk about the hope in the New Testament. And there's many, many um, Bible uh, verses that we could quote, but we are going to concentrate basically in um, what Jesus taught uh, in the Gospel of John and also what Paul taught in um, uh, 1 Corinthians and also in 1 Thessalonians. Let's uh, have a word of prayer so we can start. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the Bible and thank you in this case for the New Testament, for your words through your son, Jesus Christ, and also through the Apostle Paul. Thank you for the teaching of uh, the hope of a new life in the resurrection and the eternal life and guide us as we study this topic and this hour and also throughout the week in our homes. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So the, testa the New Testament hope, um, we need to begin by saying that uh, according to Hebrews uh, 11, 39 and 40, uh, all this referring to those heroes of the faith, you remember those names, right? Beginning with um, um, uh, uh, Abel and Enoch and Noah, all these guys that we know uh, the stories uh, of. So all these though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. What the author of the um, letter to Hebrews what is saying is that even when they waited for that, they didn't receive it. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Let me explain it to you. Even when they believed and they were heroes of the faith, they died believing in something that will come later on, that will come in the future. And they did not receive it. Why? Because God had something prepared for those who were, are going to live uh, in the last generation. So then all they will receive it uh, together. That's why um, the, the author of Hebrews says they will not may be perfect in the sense that the, the word perfect is the same word to complete. Nothing was complete until all, talking about all the believers of all generations, of all ages, will receive it at the same time. So what is that? So let me um, show this to you. The early church kept the Hebrew belief in a better life. That's why we have the heroes of the faith. So the Christian hope was not a new hope, rather the unfolding of ancient hope already nurtured by the patriarchs and prophets. So when the early church was formed out of the 12 or disciples, yeah, because Judas was replaced. So when the early church began in since the time of Jesus, they didn't embrace a new hope. They embraced the same hope of the patriarchs and prophets. So the same hope that they had and they died believing in was the same hope that gave strength, that, uh, that gave the, the hope that they needed in order to continue their journey now as Christians. Because being a different group, being a group that was formed um, out of the Judaism and was completely new and sometimes uh, judged and sometimes uh, criticized and sometimes persecuted, they needed something to give them strength and, 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 and to give them uh, what they needed in order, like, like a fuel, in order for them to continue to keep going on and to keep pressing on, that was the hope of the new life uh, 
at the end of the time. Okay, so it was the same hope in the New Testament as the same hope for, um, of the Old Testament. So, the New Testament hope um, in the New Testament begins uh, by the teachings of Jesus. And he said, I am the bread of life. We will talk about that. Uh, when he uses the expression, I am, is the Greek ego, a me. And that is referring to Exodus 3.14, which we know by heart. And then uh, he also promised that he will come again. Those are the things that we're going to talk about. What Jesus thought about uh, the, 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 the new life. Or the hope. And according to John 6, let me give you a little bit of a context. So what happened is that Jesus performed a great miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. And we all know that the 5,000 was only uh, counting the male adults. It wasn't, it, it didn't, that number didn't include the children and didn't include women. Okay, so we're talking about something like 20,000 people who ate after he um, multiplied the, 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 the bread and a few uh, fishes, right? So after that miracle and the people was completely fed, then they were trying to make him king because they said, well, this is the type of king that we need. Someone who can give us what we need, right? So they were trying to make him king by the force. They were trying to force him to take the throne. And they will claim him as their new king. So what Jesus did, he got into a boat and went to the lake. And he went to the other side of the lake, trying to stay away from that wave or making him king. So when things calmed down a little bit, then he began with his sermon that appears in John 6, which talks about the bread of life. Check, check the connection. He gave them bread. He fed them. They wanted to make him uh, king. He stayed away or, or he, uh, yeah, he, he went away from that uh, uh, movement. And then he began his sermon about the bread of life. So in his sermon, he said, is not the physical bread that you guys need. Because my kingdom is not about physical bread. My kingdom is about spiritual bread. And he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. So let's read uh, verses uh, um, 33 and 35. For the bread of life of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So the bread not only uh, satisfies people, but he, uh, the, the bread also gives life to the world. Pay attention to this. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never be thirst. So by declaring the I am, I am the bread of life, and I, and I mentioned this, the Greek, Greek ego, a me, the bread of life, um, Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. Jesus presented himself as the great I am of the Old Testament. Do you remember that um, encounter of uh, Moses with God uh, in the burning bush? And, and, and when God was uh, telling Moses that he was the chosen one to go and deliver his people out of Egypt. And then later on in the conversation, then Moses said, well, they're going to ask me uh, who sent you. And you haven't even told me your name. And God said, I am that I am. So the Hebrew people, they kept that expression, I am that I am as the name of God. Okay, and, and when Jesus used the expression, I am the bread of life, by, by the way, he used it more than once. He said also, I am the light. 
I am the life. And now he's saying, I am, I am the bread of life. They understood that he was claiming to be God. So if we believe in Jesus, then we have to believe that he is God. And he was claiming to be God. And he said, I am the bread of life. Trying to say, I am the one who makes all things possible. Including that that bread of life who came down from heaven, which is me, can give life to the entire world. So it's not limited to 5,000, it's not limited to 20,000, it's not limited to the few that want to believe in me. I have life for everyone. But check this out. The life that he is offering is not the life that, that we keep while we eat until next day. He was talking about eternal life. So he is God who makes all things possible. So now, in his same sermon, John 6, Jesus claims to be the only one who gives eternal life. This is the bread, uh, John 66, 58. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And he... Uh, he is the gift of eternal life. He is already pre a present reality. But this doesn't mean that the believer will never die. For the very expression, raise him up, which appears in um, John 6.40, presupposes coming back to life after one has died. Let me try to uh, explain it to you. So Jesus is claiming that he is the only one who gives eternal life. So... The thing is, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they uh, made different claims. For example, the Sadducees believed, they didn't believe in the resurrection, nor eternal life. On the other hand, the Pharisees believed in certain things, but they believed in a life after death, but that was based on performance and what they did in this life. So Jesus is saying, none of these guys are, 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 are right in their reasoning in, nor in their claims, because I am the bread who gives, life, who, who gives life to the whole world. And whoever believes in me will not hunger nor thirst, but will have eternal life. And he also say that whoever believes in him he will raise him up in the last day. So let me uh, explain it to you. Eternal life is offered by Jesus, who makes things possible, to whoever believes in him. But that eternal life is received by the believer. But that doesn't mean that the person is not going to die. We all will die. Well, there will be some that will not die when Jesus comes. They will be alive. But pretty much, if Jesus doesn't come in the next uh, couple of generations, we're going to die. But that doesn't mean that we will not have eternal life. We will talk about that in a little bit. That means that since we accept Jesus and believed that he's the only one who gives eternal life, then we will be resurrected in the later day. I hope that's clear. Okay. Um, Jesus also said, which uh, we already uh, read, John um, 6.40, that he is the one who resurrects those who believe in him. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So we already mentioned that. For a little bit. But he continues and say, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. So he keeps talking about the resurrection in the last day. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my body or my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him, raise him up on the last day. So um, eternal life, of course, after Jesus comes and 
then he is going to resurrect those who believe in him. At the second coming, Jesus will resurrect us, and then, and there, he will give us the gift of immortality that was ours already. Okay? So, this first part of the lesson is about Jesus offering himself eternal life, offering a resurrection in the last day. To whom? To whoever believes in him. Whoever eats of uh, him as the bread of life and drinks of his blood. That's a reference to his sacrifice. So in order for us uh, to receive eternal life, we not only have to believe that he existed, that, that he uh, did some miracles for other people, we also have to accept his sacrifice because it's through the sacrifice that we are forgiven and then we are given eternal life. All right, so now, he also said that he will come again. Let's talk about that a little bit. We can understand this in two ways. That he will come again through the Holy Spirit. Okay? According to John 6, 7, he said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, talking about the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So when Jesus promised that he will come again, uh, many people interpreted, especially those who heard him, interpret that they will come in their generation. So they will say, well, Jesus is, uh, has ascended to heaven, but he promised that he will come. So they were waiting for him. So when the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit empowered them. And they recognized the Holy Spirit as the one promised by Jesus, the helper, the other one. And they said, well, this is what Jesus promised. But they were still waiting for Jesus to come physically. So his promise has a double meaning. The promise has a first meaning that Jesus will come in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the second meaning is that Jesus will come physically to take everyone home. Okay, let's talk about that. Um, many Christians have complained about the long delay talking about the, the promise of Jesus. But how do we, in fact, know that this is a long delay? This is like a parenthesis, but let me talk about this. Um, is, it, is there a delay in the coming of Jesus? When will be the perfect time for Jesus to come? Have you ever wondered that? Well, uh, personally, I don't think that there's any delay let me tell you two reasons for what I don't think there is any delay. First of all, God is not limited on space or time. So he's never delayed. According to Paul in the uh, book of Galatians, he says that when the time or the proper time came, God sent his son. So that means that ha God has an agenda and the agenda has all the timing uh, already there. So when th things are happening is because that was the time for those thing to, things to happen. So God is not um, uh, in a hurry of doing things. And he's never delayed either. So for that first reason, he is not delaying in uh, or Jesus is not delaying in coming back to this earth. And the second reason is that Jesus himself said that the day and hour of his coming was unknown for everyone. Not even the angels know when that day and hour is going to happen. He said, but my father only. So if there is a day and hour, that means that there is no delay. It's just that the day and hour haven't uh, happened yet. So, first, God is not limited in time. So, he has his time. 
In the second, there is a day and hour. For those two reasons, there is no delay. So then, what does all that have to do with us? Well, we, we shouldn't think that God is delaying. We shouldn't think that when is this going to happen? He should have come already. We don't know better than God. He knows when the time is proper for his son to come. All right. So, we were talking about Jesus coming again. The second meaning was his coming physically to take us home. So, John 14, 1, 2 and 3 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If there were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Um, first, in these verses, Jesus promised that he will come again. Second, that he was going to prepare a place and then he will come again to take everyone with him. And the, the picture that um, is presented here is um, in the Greek, the, the bridegroom who comes to take his bride. Can you imagine a wedding ceremony? There, let's, let's say that it, it was it is happening in the church or inside the temple. Then the, the bridegroom is waiting almost at the front of uh, the, the place. And the, uh, and the bride is walking down the temple. So when, when she approaches where he is standing and waiting for her, then he grabs her hand or her arm and then they walk together. And after they are uh, married, they go to the home of the father of the bridegroom. That was the tradition. So that's what Jesus is presenting here. If I go and prepare a place in the house of my father, then I will come back and then I will take you in the same, in the same way that the bridegroom takes uh, the bride and I will take you to the, father, uh, to the house of my father. So Jesus is uh, promising that he will come back as the bridegroom uh, comes back for his bride and he will take us home. So, before we go to the other part, where Paul explains the, the, the eternal life and resurrection, we have to say that um, if Jesus is coming back for us, those who believe in the immortality of the soul, what will be the reason for Jesus to come back to take us if those who die are already up in heaven? Right? So, that's why we don't believe in the immortality of the soul. All right, let's move on. So, the New Testament hope explained it by Paul. So, three things that we are going to review in this um, section. The guarantee of the resurrection, the second coming, and then the mystery of a new body. The guarantee of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, uh, 12 uh, to 14. Now, if Christ, this is Paul talking, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection? Remember what I mentioned about the Sadducees that believed that there was no resurrection? The, so that belief um, was embraced for some of the first Christians. So Paul is trying to correct this problem. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. So, the letter, the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians was to correct so many problems. If you have the time, uh, take the time of reading this uh, letter, 1 Corinthians, thinking that there was a problematic church, a, pro, uh, a church that had so many issues. And then he writes this letter trying to 
fix or explain or correct all those issues that they were having. So when he goes all the first uh, chapters and, and we get to the uh, chapter 15, then he talks about the resurrection of the dead. So uh, Paul is saying, how come there's people among you guys that do not believe in the resurrection? Because if, if there is not resurrection, then Jesus didn't resurrect him from the dead either. So what Paul is saying is the, the, the warranty of our own resurrection is the resurrection of Jesus. And if you don't believe that the resurrection exists, then you, you cannot believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. But if Jesus was raised from the dead, then we will be resurrected. So our own resurrection is guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus. If you don't believe in that, then your faith is vain. Your hope is vain. Same as the resurrection of Jesus is vain. So we need to believe and we have to believe in the resurrection because that was guaranteed by the same resurrection of Jesus. If we want to talk about the first fruits, we can talk about that because according to the customs of um, the people in the Old Testament, um, the first fruits of the harvest, harvest were uh, brought to the, to the uh, priest and they gave it as an offering, thanking God for what they had received and what they were going to receive in the rest of the harvest. And according to Paul, Jesus is the first fruits of those who died and resurrected. So Jesus is the first offering of the resurrection. And he was taken up to heaven to present himself and present his sacrifice and also his resurrection. And it was approved by God. And then he came back. And, and also the, the Gospels talks about, talk about um, uh, other people. And they even mentioned that the number was about 50 people who resurrected at the time Jesus was resurrected. How do we explain that? We, we, we don't have much to say, but they were also the first fruits um, of the resurrection of the rest of the people. One thing was Jesus who possessed life in, his, in himself and the other ones who received life from Jesus. It's not the same thing. They receive life, but Jesus gives life. So they were also presented as the first fruits. And, and I want to say the, the, the power of life, of the life of Jesus, the power in himself uh, overcame death. And, and not only he came back to life, but those who were uh, dead and believed in him as well. All right. The second thing that Paul explains appears in 1 Thessalonians Chapter 4, verses 13, all the way to 18, but um, this is what we're going to read. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do and have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And it goes on. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then he ends with this. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll always be with the Lord. So another problem was uh, Paul trying to address. The other problem was that um, the believers in, in Thessalonica, they thought that... Um, Jesus will come in their generation, right? And that eternal life will be given to them 
when Jesus uh, came. So the problem was that life went on and <laughs> time kept going on. And some of them began to die because they were getting old. So they thought that if they were not alive, they will not receive eternal life. So then those who were alive began to mourn for those who died. Then Paul says, hey, hey, wait a minute. That's not the way it goes. Those who are dying in Christ, they will rise again. And we who are alive, said Paul, will not precede those who died. Because when Jesus comes again with the voice of a command, with a cry of command, with the voice of a trumpet and with the archangel of God, he will rise those who died in Christ. And we who are alive will be caught up in the air and we all together will be with him. So a couple of things that I have to say here. Paul is saying that those who are alive have no any advantage over those who are already dead. Because in the same way that they who die are going to be resurrected, those who are alive are going to be taken up as well to heaven. And they will meet in the air and they will go to heaven with Jesus. That's the first thing that I have to say. The second thing. So before I go to the second thing, there is no advantage from any group, right? The second thing, those who believe in the secret rapture and think that when Paul says that they're going to be caught up in the air, uh, they base part of their belief in the secret rapture in these verses. But Paul is not talking about anything secret because he said that God will come with a cry of command, with a, a voice of trumpet, with the uh, archangel of God, and he will come in the clouds of heaven. That's not secret at all. That's not secret at all. So when, when, the, when the verses that are going to be caught up in the air, it's just because that will be the reunion of those who died and resurrected and those who are still alive at the moment of the second coming. It's not talking about any rapture. It's talking about the reunion, actually, of the dead or formerly dead and those who were alive. All right, let me show you this. This is uh, supporting what I'm saying. Many who accept the theory of the natural immortality of the soul suggest that Christ, at his second coming, will bring with him from heaven the souls of the righteous dead who are already in heaven with God. Those souls can be those souls, those, can be reunited with their respective resurrected bodies. But such an interpretation is not in harmony with the overall teaching of Paul in the subject. And this is uh, it's a little bit long, but it's a, a quotation from a, um, a certain um, um, scholar, which is not a Seventh-day Adventist. That's what I, I, I put it on. The reason why the Thessalonian Christians can have hope as they grieve for the dead members of their church is that God will bring them, that is, he will resurrect these deceased believers and cause them to be present at, Christ, at Christ's return, such that they will be with him. The implication is that these deceased believers will not be at some kind of disadvantage at the parousia of Christ, but will be with him in such a way that they share equally with living believers in the glory associated with his return. Okay? And the last thing that we're going to talk about Paul's teaching about the New Testament hope is the mystery of a new body. 1 Corinthians, again, verse 15. Now verses 51 to 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Pay attention to this first uh, verse. I'm going to tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
uh, say, not all of us are going to die, but we shall all be changed. But we all are going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. And he ends with this uh, text. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Um, many people also believing in the immortality of the soul. They think that the mystery is the secret rapture. Again, there is nothing secret in the second coming of Jesus. But they believe that, and they believe that that's the mystery, that people is going, the others who are not going to be taken or raptured, according to them, are going to be wondering, well, where, where, where's my neighbor? Where's my wife? Where's my son? Or where's my, uh, my husband? Etc. They're going to be wondering because the mystery, according to them, is that they have been taken up to heaven in a secret rapture. But that's not what Paul is explaining here. Paul is explaining the mystery about the new body. Because according to Paul, those who die will be resurrected. But they are going to be given a new body. And also those who are still alive and are going to receive Jesus and going to be taken up to heaven are going to be changed as well. They're going to receive a new body. And let me talk about the new body because there are certain things that we need to understand. It's not going to be this body that is perishable. This body that dies, that gets sick, that is full of sin because we, we carry on a sinful body. And, he, and we inherit all the sins and the deterioration caused by sin for all these 6,000 years since the creation of Adam and Eve. So we are going to be changed in a spiritual body. What does it mean to have a spiritual body? Well, according to the same Bible, the book of Revelation and, and other uh, parts of the Bible, we are going to be uh, fed and nurtured by certain things in order to keep this immortality that we are going to be given because that's the reason a, a river of life exists. That's the reason a tree of life exists for those, and according to, to the book of Revelation, it's for the, healing, for the healing of the nations. And, and it provides or it bears a different fruit each month. So we are going to have go and grab all that fruit and eat it in order for us to keep this immortality. So that means that we're going to have a completely new body. All right? So the mystery that Paul is talking about is not the mystery of a secret rapture. It's the mystery of a new body that we are going to receive. And this supports what I'm saying. The mystery Paul is referring to is simply the transformation of the living righteous to join the resurrected righteous at Christ's second coming. This is the rapture. The rapture. There is no secret rapture because the second coming will be visible to all living human beings. And both the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living ones will occur at the sound of the trumpet at Christ's return. So we have to be looking forward to the sound of the trumpet. Um, personally, I, I lost my, my, my parents a long time ago. And, and I'm looking forward for, for, for the sound of the trumpet. I, I lost one of my brothers and I'm looking forward to the sound of the trumpet. I, I lost my nephew to COVID a couple of years ago and I look forward to the sound of the trumpet. And, and, and that day when the trumpet sound, even if I am dead, I will be resurrected. 
And if I am alive, I'm going to join those who are being resurrected. And we will receive the Lord in the air and will be with him forever. So there is nothing that says in the Bible that people after dying goes either to heaven or, either, or, or to hell. It says that they are in their tombs. They are just dead. That's the reason Jesus is coming back, because we are going to be transformed at his second coming. So, to end uh, this presentation, uh, I have to say that the, the hope of the New Testament, or the New Testament hope, is a timeless hope. It was the same hope of the ancient uh, Hebrew people, and, the, and, and it kept being the same hope in the New Testament uh, believers. The Lord is not slow, according to 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Though we don't know when he will come, we can be certain that he will. And that is what really matters. We have no idea of the day and hour because no one knows but the Father only. But we can trust that if Jesus promised, it will happen. What we have to do in the meantime? Well, we, we need to keep preparing ourselves. How? Well, having a relationship with Jesus Christ. What else? Well, sharing with other people what we know. Sharing with other people that live hopeless people that have no idea of what's going on after they die people that uh, keep grieving and mourning for those who have gone already and also we can pray so we can talk with God through prayer he will talk to us through his word and we can share that those conversations with other people so this is a timeless hope and we have this hope that Jesus will come again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope in the New Testament. It's not a new hope. It's the same hope that you put on your uh, children since the beginning of this world. Thank you for keeping your promises. And thank you for making all things possible through Jesus Christ, your Son. Now that we are living uh, closer to the time of the second coming. Help us to lift up your name and glorify you, glorify Jesus Christ in our own lives and also in our conversations and the way also that we live in light of this hope. Thank you again for your word in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.